think. So we are starting and I haven't done this in a while. Why am I not seeing our little recording thing? I think it's under more. Oh, it says recording. I actually see an attendee, but it's not Chris. She just came. It's Jen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, and Martha Henner. It but is no, recording, Chris. Mandy. That's oh, what it shows. Chris is there now. It is Chris. Okay. And, on my, my screen, it's not. Yeah. And do we have Nate? Or it's just in a different spot, Dave, mm -hmm. from where it used to be. But if you go to the participants, you can see the recording thing to the cloud button showing. Gotcha. So I do not I do not see Nate or Okay, well let's open up the we'll open up the meeting and we'll we'll see if he shows There's up. Chris. Okay. So it is, it is July 23. Uh, this is, um, this is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council. I'd like to call the meeting to order and see if everyone can hear us. So I'm going to go around to Pat. Can you hear us? Yes. Councillor Haneke. Present. Jennifer Taub. I'm here. Cameron is here. And so we can start the meeting. Um, pursuant to the Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. There is no in-person attendance of members of the public because it's not possible. We are completely Zoom, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. If there are technological problems, we will probably pause the meeting and address them. Um, there are no public hearings tonight. I'm, I want to talk about public comment just because we have two very different topics. And I would love to have public, I'll do a short public comment at the very beginning if anyone is interested, but I suspect that people will be interested to have comments after the planning department presentation about design guidelines and university drive. And then again, after a conversation about solar. So um, I'm going to open up the this to public comment and I'm gonna, I'm gonna recognize Chris Brestorf with her raised hand. Hi, um, thank you very much. Nate Malloy has joined as a an attendee, and you just brought him in as a panelist. So thank I you. I did, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Mandy. So let's look at the uh, Martha Hanner has her hand up. So we'll have a short um, public comment period at this time. Martha, would you like to? Is, is someone going to bring her in? <laughs> Hello, this is Martha Hanner from District 5 in Amherst. And I just wanted to provide some information about the state legislature's climate bill relevant to our solar bylaw that we're going to be discussing later tonight. As you may know, the legislature now is in the final week. And so the massive climate bill, which includes information about solar siting, is in the final conference stage with, between the Senate and the uh, House versions. And so I contacted Senator Joe Comerford's chief of staff, Jared Friedman, today to ask a little bit about the status of the legislative bill and what's in it. And I wanted to share some important information, <clears throat> specifically what's in there about the um, permitting for solar arrays and other renewable energy type uh, <clears throat> permitting is that the state is assuming the permitting authority for facilities that are 25 megawatts or larger. However, the state is not assuming permitting authority facilities 
for facilities under 25 megawatts. Instead, the state establishes guidelines for a consolidated local permitting process. So the municipality would issue one permit for the facility as opposed to having uh, several different ones. And then there would be 12 months for a municipality to issue the consolidated local permit. Although Senator Cumberford uh, is actually proposing an amendment to, to allow for extensions to the 12 month period. And so it means that the department, the state department will establish standards, requirements and procedures governing the siting and permitting of these smaller clean energy infrastructure facilities that include uniform sets of public health, safety, environmental and other standards that local governments shall require for the issuance of permits. And it goes on in detail to discuss these a little bit. So what's going to happen then is after this is passed, presumably and signed by the governor, there will be a fairly long process of say at least one year, maybe longer to set up the agency that's going to do the permitting and set the standards and so on. And I envision a robust process of establishing the standards and requirements where those towns that have clear, science-based, well-thought-out solar bylaws will really be in an advantage and will be able to be proactive in determining what these criteria and requirements are going to be. And so it's my conclusion that we will definitely be at an advantage if we forge ahead now in a concerted way to establish for Amherst a, a good, clear solar bylaw that that will stand us in good stead. And Senator Comerford has promised that after this session is over, they have a little more breathing space, that she will set up a public forum to describe and discuss uh, the climate bill in more detail so that we can all understand better what's included. So I, I just wanted to announce that now because it's fresh information that I just obtained today. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. That's terrific. Good to know. Uh, Janet McGowan has her hand up. Go ahead, Mark, uh, Janet. Hi, um, hi, I'm Janet McGowan. I'm still on the planning board um, and I live at 706 Southeast Street. Um, I am making a comment to talk about some issues that I raised and other people raised during the discussions about the university drive overlay, which I think started like somewhere in March or actually February or so of this year. Um, I, I was very concerned that the planning board um, did not contact um, University Drive businesses, property property owners, and residents that live on University Drive or near it. Um, I think their information, their their thoughts, their concerns, their good ideas um, would have been helpful to the prof process. And um, I contacted two people: one who runs a business on University Drive and a resident nearby, and they both immediately contacted me and were interested in being involved with the process. One of them wrote to the planning board saying that. Um, the other concern that was raised by um, people who attended our, our, our meetings were, is University Drive is really dominated by wetlands. It probably isn't the greatest place um, to build things. And, you know, it, you know, several people, one particularly um, resident who's an expert in, in, um, um, development basically thought that there should be an overall analysis of the wetlands conditions uh, and the capacity to build there and the possible impacts on the wetlands as a whole in University Drive. Nobody thought it was that expensive to do. If it's a poor site for building a lot of high big buildings, we should probably know that before we do a rezoning process and go through all the permitting process. While the ComCom will go parcel by parcel, They'll never, it'll be a piecemeal approach and you'll never be able to sit back and look at the whole wetland and the whole ecosystem. Um, and you won't have an overall analysis. So I think that's something um, that was missing. 
Um, another gap I think we had was that we didn't really look at other college and university towns for what they did in a similar situation of, you know, rezoning near a large university, um, you know, with the eye towards mostly student housing, but also trying to build a really vital kind of fun, interesting place to shop and, and do all sorts of things. Um, we never looked at other examples, um, you know, or talked to them to see what would they do. What would, would you, what worked out? What didn't work out? What would they do again or not do again? And, you know, kind of pick their brains for ideas. I think that'd be super useful because we're not, this isn't the, we aren't the first town to confront this sort of thing or try to create this kind of district. Another concern, um, just this is not a, you know, the housing subcommittee, we, we kind of went at the last minute from, we started at four floors and went to five and we voted six floors. And at the housing subcommittee, I raised the idea that if we're going to a sixth floor, that we get something in exchange for it, and maybe a higher percentage of affordable housing, you know, maybe twenty percent for that extra floor, and also looking at um, not just um, low income housing, but sort of, um, I would think of sort of like middle income housing because we seem to be having a missing middle problem. Um, the people on the I'm not on the housing subcommittee. I was just making that comment, and. Um, most of the members were supportive, but it didn't really make it into the final draft and we didn't really have time to discuss it at our last meeting. So I just wanted to like bookmark that. So that idea is, you know, we're giving a lot of extra density and value in the zoning and we should be asking for what we want to help, you know, move the town and make our community a little stronger. Um, so I think, you know, sort of these research gaps um, and, you know, the lack of community, community outreach is something that your committee can do. I know you guys are busy, but I, I don't think it'd be that hard to contact people, you know, on University Drive who work there, who own businesses, who own property, and the people who live there. Um, I also had a concern that I raised over and over is if you're, if we're rezoning for a lot of density, we're adding a lot of value. And we know that people in our town are making a lot of money by building expensive apartments. And what's the impact that we also really liked on the planning board, the kind of medical community and facilities there, like the, the Center for Extended Care, the Urgent Care, the Pediatrician's Office, and a lot of nursing homes in Amer in Massachusetts are closing because they're not very profitable. And so would, would an inadvertent impact be that these facilities aren't as valuable? And so they decide the owner of the building or the owner of the property decides it'd be better to build, you know, some student dorms and things like that. So um, I think that kind of like unintended impacts, and I had suggested removing those. It's, I think it's the office park part of University Drive, removing that from the overlay to sort of protect those medical facilities that we like to see and um, are super useful to have in our town and not always to drive to Hadley or Northampton. Um, and so, you know, just, I think by consulting with other other organiz you know, other towns and cities that have had these kind of districts, I think we could fill those gaps. So I'm sorry to have this hefty list. I actually cut it down a little, but um, I just wanted to present that to you. And I also voted in support of this with um, kind of my worries and concerns. But thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Janet. And there will be a short uh, public comment section after, after we discuss the University Drive. Um, update. So if you left out some things, you can weigh, weigh in them. Um, I needed to note for the record that Councillor Ette joined us about 635. Thank you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Wonderful. So we're all here and accounted for. I would like to turn the floor over to the planning department. We have Nate and Christine to talk about a couple of topics. One is the University Drive overlay, and the other is um, sort of update on the design guidelines that are being uh, developed. So, uh, and we, we, it's about quarter of seven, so I was thinking roughly an hour for this uh, process would be terrific. If we can do it less than that, that's great, um, but we probably won't start a conversation about solar bylaw until at least 7.30. Nate is, if you don't mind, Nate is going to do the bulk of the presentation about both of these topics. So if you would recognize him. I recognize him. Sure. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. And do you have a preference 
so you know they're the same agenda item but do you want to talk about downtown design standards first or the uh, overlay let's just talk about the overlay that was just mentioned so let's sure yeah okay. so the planning board's actually been talking about this for almost a year uh, and staff has looking at university drive as a potential area uh, for an overlay zone and so i'll have a map and i have text i can show uh, in a minute um, i will say that you know and as an overlay zone, it doesn't replace any existing zoning. So, you know, it's like, think of layers. And so there's still the base zoning. There's already a few, there's an overlay district there on University Drive. And so this would be another one that would be voluntary for property owners or developers or applicants to use. So we're not, you know, the benefit of that is it only applies to mixed use buildings. It doesn't negate or change anything else about what's already there. So if someone wants to come in and do an office building or a research facility, and everything that's there is left in place. Uh, and so the impetus for this was looking at areas where we could have denser housing. Um, and you know, when, when originally proposed, you know, I'll say it, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to see student housing there, right? Like the U3 advisors report from 2014 and other reports have looked at University Drive over the years and said, you know, this could be an area for dense housing. And so, you know, in a lot of our conversations in terms of project review, there's always questions about, you know, is this going to be filled with students? Is, you know, a 10 unit apartment building going to be students? And, you know, and the implications there are that, you know, there's nothing wrong with students living throughout town. It's just that the pressures they put on the housing market, especially in terms of pricing out many non-students. And so I think, you know, staff had said we could have a discussion about where could we have student housing? Where, where can we actually allow it? We don't, you know, we allow it everywhere in terms of apartments or mixed use buildings, but could we say there's, you know, specific areas where it makes sense. And over time, you know, the, the proposal has changed. And so, you know, it's not specifically a student housing overlay district, it's a mixed use overlay district. And so there's requirements that the first floor of every building has, you know, 75% of the facade facing the street needs to be a non-residential use uh, to a certain depth, right? So there's always a component that it will be a non-residential piece. Um, we do allow, as Janet mentioned, going up to six floors. And so, you know, there's some uh, discussion about how high that is. Um, you know, the planning board voted this along. They voted to recommend uh, the overlay as a zoning amendment. Uh, and there was some discussion about what could happen with it, but really they said they've been talking about it long enough. And the chair of the housing subcommittee and others felt, well, let's move it along because then it can get to a point where it's real. And, you know, so their thought was it could change, right? There's still some things to consider and there's still other pieces to look at, but let's, you know, ask council to refer it, and, you know, come back to the planning board and to the CRC, likely right and others. And then there's a whole nother discussion that'll happen that could take a few more months or however long. And so I think that just the kind of the, idea was there was a number of consensus points. There was issues that were still had to be resolved, but it was at a point where it could move forward. Um, and so I was going to share my screen. If that's visible for everyone. Yes. If you can expand it in any way, that would be lovely. Yeah. I don't. I mean, you're showing the entirety of it, so that's, that's fine. And also, Nate, Nate, I wanted to ask if you are interested in questions as they come up, or would you like the the board, the committee at least, to just hold your questions, our questions, until the end? Yeah, I, I think um, you could raise hands throughout, I guess, if you want. I, I'll just describe the geographic area. And so the solid black line from uh, Amity Street down to uh, Route 9, and then the properties on either side of University Drive. So the black area would be the proposed overlay. Originally, the dotted lines were other areas that it could have encompassed. And so those have been removed for now. Um, so it's really just kind of the properties along, you know, a 1500 foot section of University Drive. And like I said, it doesn't replace the, any zoning that's here. So there's office park, there's limited business, there's um, you know, um, R&D overlay, and then the overlay only applies to mixed use buildings. It allows them to be, uh, you know, there's no cap on the number of units as there is now, six floors. The right of way for University Drive is almost a hundred feet and we're requiring pretty, you know, 25 foot setbacks. So the, you know, the 
the streetscape is still going to be very wide open. And the idea is that there's a service drive on the west side of University Drive right now. There's two parallel roads, essentially. And the goal is to have that access drive become a pedestrian way. And there's a two or three foot sidewalk right on University Drive on the west side. It's crumbling. It's very narrow. The idea would be to remove that, keep it part of the tree belt to save all the red maples there, and then have you know an eight to 10 foot wide pedestrian path that is part of the access drive now, and um, and then have the buildings behind that. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Janet was right that there are a lot of wetlands. I think staff feels that the Conservation Commission can review that. And so, you know, the pre and post development uh, standards have to be met. So someone, you know, could come in and propose something and the Conservation Commission would have to, you know, approve it. And that's not, you know, I, don't, I think that's still part of any development. And so, you know, if this could allow for, you know, and so I think some of the things the planning board talked about was, okay, so say there are wetlands and this get moves forward and it was adopted. And what if this doesn't work, right? What if no one's using this? Well, maybe we need to change it. Or what if, there, you know, so the thought is, well, we say that we could be more nimble in terms of zoning. Is there a chance for this to, to work? And so Bruce Coldham had talked to a number of college communities and the housing su subcommittee starting to look into it. And what it sounds like is there's a number of strategies that work for different communities. They have to be tailored. And it also sounds like they need to evolve. And so some communities might have a strategy that's 10 years old, but it needs to change, right? So if they have an overlay, maybe after so many years, it served its purpose. And then some of the things have to change within the overlay. And so for now, this is the starting point. And you know, the hope was to let's have require mixed use buildings, let's have higher density, and let's try to get a streetscape, a vibrant uh, streetscape here. So, you know, their apartments aren't part of the overlay. Uh, that was a one consideration. And the worry was that if it was only apartments, with the housing market being so strong, developers would only build apartments and we'd lose any any sense of streetscape or any kind of non-residential use space. And so, you know, we're moving this forward as, you know, really trying to encourage both housing and economic development. And so, you know, I think there's been, you know, the planning board has agreed to some of these things that, well, yeah, let's try to say what we want here, not maybe what's good in the short term in terms of housing, but what if we actually have density here? And even if some of those non-residential spaces are vacant for a time, eventually there could be uh, a need for them to be filled with something. And so, you know, they're saying, well, let's, you know, this could be a 10 year planning horizon. Let's make sure we, you know, we, we get what we want and see if there's any, you know, if there's any, any use of it. And so, um, you know, anyways, this is just the start. So if there's any questions. Uh, Mandy Jo, or Councilor Haneke has her hand up. Um, yeah, a, a couple of questions and more clarification too. Um, and then some concerns also. First, whatever slides you showed, can we get them so that we can look at them um, for this one and whatever the next one is, because they're not in the packet yet. So they are after the in, meeting. Excuse me, they are in our folder. I oh, just, they are now? I just saw them 10 minutes before the meeting okay. in our folder, but not in the packet. Excellent, thank you. Um, so is if the runway is 100 feet wide on U Drive, a little bit about a 25 foot additional set, which I presume is on both sides of the street, um, but you, you didn't say, um, does, would that actually make the street less walkable because it's a lot wider? Um, and so a question that goes along with that is, is the access drive on the right of way? Um, because I understand what the point of using that access drive as a walkable sort of large sidewalk is, um, but if it's in the right of way, that's up to the town. It, you don't need the setback back then, right? Um, so I, I guess it's hard to see whether it's in the right of way or not. And then is that 25 foot setback required on both sides? And if so, why would it be required on both sides instead of just the side that's aiming to use the, the sort of access drive as a walkable area? So that's one question. Um, I'm curious about why we aren't considering the dotted line sections to include include in the zone um, and maybe even a little bit farther. Um, it was hard to see on the map you put up exactly where the different zones 
um, current zoning changes. There's this big purple area. I think if I'm guessing right, is that a historic district, but not a local historic district? Is that, so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why we're not including all four corners instead of just two of the four corners at each intersection other than the ED that's up at Amity Drive. Because um, it seems to me you'd want all of them, not just half of them, especially since one of the corners not included, maybe it wasn't included, is already redeveloped with a mixed use building. Um, and then you said it only applies to mixed use. Um, I'm concerned. We've seen a lot of mixed use buildings go up with a lot of empty commercial space for years and years that we might be given our latest, the last, I know it's old, the last commercial sort of space study um, that we might already be well supplied with commercial space such that these buildings, if built, would just have empty first floors for years upon years, which does not create a walkable environment. Um, and so what about, and I think you mentioned this at one point, Nate, during the planning board discussions, but was there thought given to, instead of requiring mixed use buildings and not apartments, requiring either of, allowing either of those buildings and requiring no matter which type is built, making the first floor, I don't know whether it's called R1 or whatever the commercial standard is of 15 foot or 16 foot ceilings with the um, firewalls and all of that between the first and second floor, such that even if residential goes in initially, it is already built to commercial standards so that if in the future commercial is more desirable or becomes better, becomes needed, it could be converted at the end of a lease to a commercial space um, instead of requiring them all to be mixed use now when we might already be saturated in our commercial retail space in town. Go ahead, yeah, I, uh, yeah. yeah I, so, you know, I think that um, going from your last comment backwards, yeah, that, that had been discussed. I think a number of the planning board members really wanted to have you know mixed use and not lose it. So we had different iterations of this bylaw and discussion. So you know, at one point it was you know mixed use within 500 feet of the intersection and everything else in between. So you know a thousand feet along the roadway could be apartments or social dormitories, or you know you could have mixed use buildings and only apartments every 300 feet or something. And you know there's different discussions in terms of how that would work. Uh, you know, and so what we settled on was you know. 75% of the facade back to a depth of 24 feet. So that, you know, if you're a double loaded corridor, the back half of the building on the first floor can still be residential. It could be storage, it could be parking, it could be whatever, but you know, at least this part facing the street is non-residential. Um, you know, we talked about, right, the building code, could you say that it's built so that it could be converted? And that, you know, that is something we discussed, uh, you know, with the building commissioner and, staff looked at. So I think there's probably, you know, like I said, if, if you know, there's probably a few different ways you could um, require that. I think, you know, much of the planning board and, you know, public comment was there's already businesses there. And if there's a lot more people living there, wouldn't it be nice if there's space? And so, you know, the concern would be if you say, okay, well, you don't need to have it, uh, you know, how easy is it to retrofit it in terms of bringing in, say, additional water or sewer or, you know, so typically we expect the developer to at least think about what kind of space they would want in terms of say utility stub outs or certain locations of things, you know, leaving room in a building to have a chase way up to the fifth floor for ventilation, right? If they don't, then it becomes difficult after if they're going to put in a kitchen hood or something. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think they're all great. I think that's a really good discussion. And I think where we landed was, well, when the planning board voted, there was two versions of this one that was kind of housing centric and one that was mix, mixed use and kind of, you know, try to balance housing and economic development. And so I, you know, I, I think either one could be appropriate. I don't, you know, I, I don't necessarily have the right answer in terms of, you know, what's the best there. I, I, I do think that given the housing market is so strong that if we said, you know, just go ahead and build apartments, oh, but you could do mixed use buildings, we're, we would just see apartments. And I don't know if anyone would actually consider the site layout. So, you know, that was discussed in terms of like, well, 
in the future they could convert it well they might not have the room for parking because they built a bigger building and so you know if you want to have a restaurant or a retail space what's the parking requirement or what a developer thinks they need to support that non-residential space and it's like if you build an apartment building so big that then all of a sudden you can't have your 30 parking spaces you think you need to support you know two small commercial spaces it's really hard to retrofit that into a site and so the idea would be let's plan for having something um and you know like i said if this doesn't get used and we find that we hear from a lot of people that that mixed use requirement is too onerous well maybe we change it but at least you know go for it right now because eventually that space you know could serve a purpose um in terms of the right of way i was going to show google a google um street view uh the east side so here's uh um North is up, here's Amity Street. The right of way starts here at the edge of this parking lot and then extends to what is the edge of the curb here. So the, the tree belt and the access drive is on private property. And so having the 24, 25 foot setbacks, you know, doesn't change how the road feels. So, you know, most of this is wetland on the east side. We have swift way, bike way. And so we wanna maintain that. We wanna maintain that and not, you know, say let's have a 10 foot setback and all of a sudden uh, something could encroach here. And honestly, with some of the wetlands here, uh, that wouldn't work. So, you know, the thought would be, well, we have, we're saying you could have taller buildings, but the idea would be, you know, the buildings are spread out far enough that you don't have a canyon-like effect. Um, and so you know, if you go into street view here, you know, the idea is get rid of the sidewalk on this side. This is the west side. Here's the access drive. And then you know be able to maintain these trees, right? So there's this really nice row of trees here. Let's put the sidewalk back here on the existing pavement, make this grass, or we could widen the shoulder for a bike lane or something. But you know, right now University Drive is really narrow, and you know this sidewalk isn't used. And so the idea is, you know, we're not going to, we don't want to impact any of these trees here or here. Let's have the buildings be back here. So you know. The, with the setback right now, say where the edge of these parking spaces are, that would be the end of the setback. So this building could be, you know, 20 feet, 25 feet closer than it is, but still set back from the from the curb. And so those, those setbacks were discussed in terms of what in terms of what's appropriate and how does it feel. Um, and I think you had one other question. Oh, the the corners. Yeah, that was a big discussion. The geographic area. I think there, I think a number of planning board members and others wanted to include that south corner. Uh, where um, Amity Street and Route 9 meet. Uh, and there are some discussions about, you know, how far do you extend it, you know, in all directions. And so, uh, you know, some of it is that there's many zoning districts there. So it's not like, oh, let's just apply it to Office Park. Well, Office Park might only cover four properties. So as an overlay, it can bridge different, it doesn't matter really what the base zoning is. The idea is we're saying, we think this area is appropriate for this mixed use purpose. Uh, and I think it could go to cover the four corners of the intersection. There are some historic homes there. So some there was discussion about what's the transition if we're allowing you know, such tall buildings, do we really want that on all four corners of the intersection or would maybe the south side of the intersection be more appropriate for four stories? Uh, and is that the same overlay or is it something different? And so we haven't, you know, again, I think that's a discussion point, you know, how, you know, is it, could it be moved a little bit? I mean, I think, to the north and east and west, I feel like those boundaries are, you know, there's reasons why they end there, you know, town line, or there's a pretty distinct geographic, um, you know, or, or natural feature to the east. And then to the south, maybe there's discussions about how far south it goes, but. Um, Nate, you know, could, could you just for this, the purpose of the conversation, could you just bring up that diagram again and enlarge the sections as you talk about them? Yeah, so this is the, um, again, here's the town line. So here's west and here's south of University Drive. And so here's five college realtors right here in Ginger Garden. Uh, this is one University Drive south now, the newer, newer building, the vet's office. And so the, you know, the boundary is just along Route 9. There had been some original discussion about you know, would it include, um, you know, this area and then possibly, 
this area. And so at one point it was like maybe just here or both. And so the planning board decided not to go south of Route 9. Uh, you know, and so these are some historic homes. This is, you know, at what point would you, you know, do you bring it to, you know, you know, there could be another stopping point, for instance, but this was what was decided. To the north, ironically, there's this one property, zone BL, uh, that had been considered and then was not, you know, it's just a, um, you know, the rest is, you know, RN. Uh, this had, you know, is a, the one house on the corner there. Jennifer. Sorry, you had your hand up first, if you wanna. Okay. okay. Um, so I just wanna put in, I, my, I would, I think having mixed use is, that would be preferable. I think with all those six stories of residential housing per eight, that's, those are several blocks. I mean, that is a lot of residents that, could potentially be living there. And I think if they can't, if mixed use can't be supported with, you know, you're talking about thousands of residents, um, I, I'd be surprised if that, that, that would be, um, we could not support mixed use on the first floor. And I, I think it's very easy for residents that live there to go to Hadley and why not do what we can to attract businesses and encourage businesses to be there so that you know, Amherst residents can spend more dollars in Amherst than, you know, they'll, the temptation will be to go to Hadley, probably not to go to downtown Amherst, but to go, I guess they're closer to the shopping in Hadley than to downtown. So I did want to, a couple of, I wanted to ask following up on uh, Janet McGowan's uh, comment. So you said that the overlay district wouldn't change any zoning. For what's there, but there are on the east side of university at least two um, senior uh, retirement residences, and I think a senior housing or maybe even a, a nursing home. And if that could, if the overlay district was there, included that, would that be a disincentive? I mean, would the owners of that property be tempted to sell or to develop a six-story apartment rather than? you know, having other, ser providing other services? Um, you know, I, so staff had talked about this and was brought up and, you know, sometimes, you know, what we would say, you know, if that were me and all of a sudden it's like, wow, my property is worth a lot more, I would ask way too much. And then I would fund my operation. And some of those properties are big enough. You could build on the front and have, a you know, a separate building and still have, you know, the operation as, you know, the extended care or any of those services. So, you know, I don't, to me, it's like if the, you know, uh, I think Cooley Dickinson now owns most of it. If it's operating well and it's doing business, I don't see that it, you know, is going to become so valuable that someone is going to say, you know, it's worth me buying it, tearing it all down just to build a mixed use building. But if it, they think it is, and I'm the owner of that property, to me, the leverage is with the owners, not with the developer, right? So you could negotiate something, you'd make it work. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I actually see that happening. I mean, we were envisioning that if this were on the big Y property, that big Y would stay and they would build something on the front and that, you know, you would reuse the, the, the asphalt. And, you know, and so, um, you know, even with some of the other buildings, um, like 100 University Drive, it's an office building now, we would say, okay, we would think that there'd be a, a second building on the property, not that they would take down that office building. It's just, there's so much effort to do that, uh, especially with the, the bigger buildings. And so, we had, we didn't see that as a a big concern. We actually you know would see it as well if you know there's other there's probably more opportune properties before you get to those properties to redevelop, right? There's probably many more property you know most of the properties on University Drive before you start looking at the extended care. There's probably other others that are a priority. One other question with the six stories could and where would that come out of CRC or the planning department or where would that conversation happen about increasing that maybe the percentage of affordable units required. Yeah, the um, you know, that was discussed, and I think some planning board members felt the, you know, what we were providing in terms of say extra housing and tax dollars and other things, there were benefits to the town. It's not like we were losing on it. And inclusionary zoning still would apply, right? So you still get the 12% and 
you know, at different 60% AMI or 80% AMI. So if you had a, you know, hundred unit development, you're still going to get your some affordable units. Um, and there was some discussion, right, about what does it mean if you have missing middle uh, inclusionary zoning? And it's something that the housing trust has talked about. And so anything above 80% AMI is not regulated by the state. It would become essentially a local restriction that the town would have to monitor and, and enforce. It's not a bad thing. It's just an extra thing. It hasn't been, you know, I've, I've suggested it. Like, could we, you know, if you have a bigger development, get, you know, 5% more of the units, like up to 17% of all units and have some be missing middle. I think, you know, um, there's probably more to it than just say add to some percentage, right? Because all of a sudden uh, those units have to be marketed. They have to be monitored. They have, to, you know, there's a deed restriction. And so um, that, you know, I think that's a, it's a little bit bigger conversation in terms of how does that work? Uh, and so, but I think if it comes back, you know, if, it, if this, you know, this moves forward and it re is referred back, then I think that's when it can happen, right? So there'll be public hearings and essentially there's a whole another set of a process to review this. And so, you know, is, you know, you, we could say, well, if there's a, a lot of density here is the current inclusionary zoning, um, you know, does it get what we want in terms of affordable housing or does it need to be modified? As part, of, as part of just the overlay, right? It wouldn't apply to everything, but just the overlay. Okay, thank you. I was wondering where the when the conversation happened and you're saying it's a little later down in the process. Right. Along, thank you. Chris, do you wanna add something to that? You have your hand up. Yeah, it's just like a supplement. Um, I think that once this goes to town council and town council refers it back, it would be referred to the planning board and the CRC and each um, body could make suggestions about how to amend it and it may be that it ends up sort of like things happen in the legislature in boston where you know the house does one thing and the uh higher um chamber does something else and then they come back together and create something that they can both move forward with so there will be time to make these changes later on thank you pat do you want to go ahead you're, you're, you're... Go ahead, Pam. I'll go after you. Um, I had a couple questions. That um, one was: is has there been any public forum at all to solicit besides just you know public comment on a particular evening? Anything in particular to solicit public comment? No. The you know the chair of the planning board felt that you know this had been discussed over almost a year that there had been some you know time for public comment. So members of the public. Did hear about it and they came it wasn't a, any direct outreach in terms of property owners or anyone else and so typically when there's a zoning amendment you know it's not even a zoning amendment right it's just to me it would be a an idea of having a zoning amendment you know this for instance the planning board could have said no to this and then it just wouldn't have gone anywhere and so typically we would not email or you know notify by mailing property owners in a zoning change I mean, I, I agree this is a discrete area, but typically say we're thinking about, oh, we're maybe changing something with, with a residential use. We're not gonna send out a mailing to a thousand properties to say that we're considering changing a zoning amendment. That's not a legal requirement. But anyways, the hope was that if this moves forward, we would have you know, specific, there'd be public hearings and be notifications. And you know, once it became something real was kind of the idea is like now we can um, you know, present it. Thank you. It was, yeah, it was sort of a yes or no question. Um, another yes or no question is kind of, has UMass been in conversation with the planning department um, as they have discussed this overlay zone? Uh, UMass attended a meeting of the planning board uh, maybe twice in the last year they've been at meetings where this has been discussed. I don't know if it's, you know, how directly in terms of their comments on this, uh, but they, they attended meetings where housing was discussed and you know. Thank you. And then my third question has to do with the bike path and the fact that, that we have a super duper swift way on the east side of uh, University Drive. It To me, it would not make sense to have another 10 foot wide multi-use path on the west side um, since that would be primarily the housing aspect. I understand you'd have to cross over the street to get over to the the super duper highway for the bikes, but um, I think that would be some consideration that it may not need to be replicated or duplicated. Pat, 
Yes, you have your hand up. Thank you. I I was not going to speak because Mandy brought up the issue that I was curious about, about current mixed use buildings, uh, say off College Street, where nothing's happening in the first floor, no commercial sp uh, space is going in. And I know that there have been talks with the uh, Amherst Food Co-op, but I don't think they've gone anywhere because of the cost. Um, but I want to talk a little bit. There's an impact on commercial businesses of online shopping, of Amazon and all this delivery. We've seen a mall um, fall apart in a certain kind of sense. And there could be some exciting things that could be put in there. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the character of our community. My, I'm talking about a college town in a different way. Uh, one of the things I, I keep thinking of, about Great Barrington, where my son went out, was at college, and how the restaurants were quirky, the bookstore, there, there were quirky businesses. And we've lost that. We've lost the yarn shops and, and uh, incense-driven, wonderful places I can't think of the name of anymore. Um, we've lost that quirkiness to some very big residential buildings. I don't care whether you like the buildings or you don't, but we lost some character of really being a college community. And my concern is, one, uh, things like the bike exchange. What will happen if a developer can come in and put in a modern um, mixed use building? And I'm interested in this project, so this is but uh, in a good way, but they come in, they get rid of the, you know, we're talking about, well, we can keep the senior places open, but are you gonna keep the bike exchange open or the little pizza place that couldn't necessarily afford? Is there any thought to integrating some of the businesses that already exist, or are we just going to make this facade of businesses that are not open? Uh, you know, there are campsites behind some of those buildings that are used by homeless community members. And I wish they didn't have to be there, but they're there. What will happen to them? Um, so I'm looking at the character in a slightly different way. And I do support increased housing. I I love the walkways and things like that, but I'm really, we're kind of erasing some important small businesses because this is still, it's going to all be about the money. We know that. It's going to be about the money. So I probably didn't need to hear me speak, but I needed to. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hanneke. Thank you. Um, two things that have come up from the conversation. The first is when talking about mixed use, um, you know, Pat makes a good point, but I, I guess I'm curious as we regulate mixed use, are there prohibited types of uses in a mixed use building? Um, can a grocery store be in a mixed use building? Can an insurance agency be in a mixed use building? Can a bike exchange, can a research and development park be in a mixed use building? What, what, what is the parameters around what can actually go in a mixed use building? Because I, I, I don't, and I don't know whether that changes because it's an overlay with specific mixed use things or whether it follows whatever the zoning definition of mixed use is. Um, so that's sort of a general question and specific to this. My next one is, it sounds like as, as um, the two of you talk about this, the planning board voted, you talk about it coming to the council for referral to CRC and, and the planning board for what might be hearings and all, but you're also talking about it in very much a, um, this isn't a, 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 this is an evolving, set of regulations, um, very much evolving, whereas you're not even sure whether the planning board, when it comes back to them, will stick with what they've already voted to support or not. So I guess I'm, and then and then Chris talked about, um, well, the planning board might go one way and CRC might go another, and then they'll get together somehow, although we don't really have a mechanism for that because it's planning board, and then CRC, and then council as how it's been done in the past. So I'd really like you to talk more about actually, you know, how you actually foresee 
a planning board reacting to or at all seeing any potential changes that that CRC might discuss, might recommend, might vote on um, when that happens. It sounds like you see this as sort of very well formed enough for a hearing, but yet also very much within um, a, a system that a, a place where there could be massive changes to it um, that could change sort of all sorts of things. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about your idea of what those next steps are besides just planning board voted to support it. It goes to the council. The council will refer it if they choose to, you know, what's your vision? Thanks. Yeah. Chris has her hand up. I'll, I'll say a few things. So, you know, the, the planning board discussed like what's the purpose and goal of this and so is it strictly housing is it housing and economic development and so how do we build off that and so you know my thought is if we wanted to say this is just a housing overlay yeah i would say no mixed use buildings let's just say we're going to allow student housing only in the overlay social dormitories you know max build out that's what we're going to do but that's not what we're going to do right so that's not what the purpose and goal of the overlay is and so to me Part of the discussion is I think there's people in town that may want a number of different things and purposes out of this overlay and what is the right one and that like I said that may evolve right there may be what we think is the right one now and it might need to change and so um, you know and some people might think that the housing overlay right without any mixed use is what we really need and so some of the planning board members said they see this as you know one step in a process and a strategy is to say well how can we protect other neighborhoods you know, let's work on this. Let's actually allow places where students can, you know, or denser housing can be. And then let's look at other measures uh, in other neighborhoods, right? Let's start looking, working to get, you know, having multiple strategies come forward at the same time, or maybe this is the first step and then there's going to be others. And so, you know, that's, to me, that's where things could change. In terms of planning board and CRC process, there could always be a joint hearing, or maybe the CRC really feels strongly about one piece. And maybe the planning board really feels strongly about one piece, and then that has to be, you know, that has to be resolved. And that could be um, whether it's a, a joint meeting or then that goes back to council and there's actually two recommendations. And then the council has to, you know, hear from both, you know, the CRC and staff. I, I think some of it would be, let's make sure we have a clear purpose and goal. And can we agree on how the overlay is achieving that? And uh, so, like I said, I think people will have different ideas for what a goal and purpose should be of this overlay. I would go to Christine before I go to Jennifer. Okay, I just wanted to say two things. I think with regard to the uses that Mandy, um, the Councillor Haneke brought up, um, I think it was Councillor Haneke. Anyway, it would be it would revert to what uses are allowed in the underlying zoning district. So the underlying zoning district of most of this is BL. So the uses that are allowed in the BL district would be those that are allowed in the commercial portion of the um, building. That's the way it works in the uh, BG zoning district downtown for mixed use buildings, the types of uses that are allowed in the mixed use portion, um, the non residential portion are those that are ordinarily allowed in BG, and there may be some uses that would require a special permit. So I think that's the answer to that, although we could work on that if that is disagreeable and and people have a reason for not um, thinking that that's a good idea. The second thing is that I wanted to remind people about when we had those 11 uh, zoning amendments going through um, the planning board and the CRC, there was an iterative process when um, the planning board would hold a public hearing session, they would come up with some questions or changes. Um, the CRC would often uh, wait uh, to come up with their recommendation about that until they heard what the planning board's recommendation was. So I think there is um, precedent for that kind of back and forth um, d uh, parallel hearings. And eventually, um, we did reach resolution on, on most of the things that we were studying back at that time. I can't remember what, what year it was. But um, so we have experience with that going back and forth from the planning board to the CRC about what is the final version of this going to include. And, and Chris, before, before you sign off, um, if you could suggest, for instance, who might who might be writing the drafts? Is this a planning board effort or is this a CRC effort? Well, the draft is already written. So we Correct. have a draft. And Correct. The draft would be 
um, presented to town council and then town council would decide is this ready to be uh, sent to um, the planning board and the CRC for public hearings. Town council could decide, no, this isn't ready and they want the planning board to do more work on it. Um, so that would be a, you know, an, a potential outcome. In our opinion, it is ready to be um, sent to town council for a referral. But, um, you know, that's probably something that you might consider contributing to that conversation. Thank you. Um, would you call me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to add, I totally agreed with everything you said. I really miss the quirky, yes, <laughs> the, the quirky shops, you know, the cottage shop that had the yarn shop, the music store, the um, Hayes Antiques. My bike is at Hampshire Bike Exchange for the week now. Um, so, and I think that's maybe why in terms of reaching out to some of the small businesses that are there, I mean, I, I, I hope we can do everything that we can to keep the shops that are on University Drive and attract new ones. And I think in terms of it being, we're talking of it being an overlay, not just for students, but for other residents as well. And I think as the more that it can have, some of those unique shops and and the commercial that draws people there. I guess because I live close to University Drive, I solicit businesses there all the time. The little sandwich shop next to Hampshire Bike Exchange. So I, I just I think it would be we would we could gain a lot with this overlay, but I think we would be losing it if there was any kind of a disincentive for the commercial, which could be it, it could be an insurance company, Hampshire Bike Exchange, a restaurant, whatever it would be. But um, so I again, maybe there, you know, that that's a reason to reach out to some of the commercial establishments there, because um, I would hate for Hampshire Bike Exchange to think they're going to be driven away by this. You know, they're a really valued, longstanding business in town. Um, and, and I also want to ask, does the CRC ever get together with the planning board? Is that something like we have had a joint meeting with the Affordable Housing Trust? We could probably do that with the planning board. I'm seeing heads nodding. Yeah, the CRC did have joint meetings with the planning board during those um, conversations about zoning. So we have precedent for that. Did we? You mean the last council session? That would have been like in 2021. When okay, we had I wasn't here. Okay, meeting. I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. that was a muddle. <laughs> um, um, Councilor Haneke, this, I just want to note that it's, it's just about 7.30 and we had talked about perhaps being able to start um, solar bylaw conversation at 7.30-ish. Um, but I, we have Nate and we have Christine here. I would really like to con continue in the, the vein of uh, this topic and the um, design development. So Mandy, Councillor Haneke, if you want to follow up with your last question and then I think we should transition to a new topic. Yes, thank you. Um, going back to the process, um, the process that Christine was referencing was when we didn't have hearings on the table, um, when we were developing and talking about, I think, Pam, you weren't on the council, but you were very much involved in a rewrite of a BL and there were no hearings. It was just development sort of sort of what the planning board already went through um, and that's sort of what I'm hearing you talk about now so I've got concerns about sending it to hearing when we haven't had those discussions it's why I've been asking for this and updates and all um, because I worry that maybe we are on two different pages or that the community isn't uh, uh, you know Nate was Nate Nate said it perfectly, what's the goal? Um, and there might be different goals. And if you don't have the goal set before you start hearings, as Pat and I saw, um, and even CRC saw with last terms, Pat and I's proposals last terms, things get very complicated very quickly and very frustrating very quickly when you're in the middle of public hearings, um, because it becomes a lot harder to deal with different versions in different bodies because there's a 
then then what happens when you get to the council and one body's recommended one version and one body's recommended another and it's not one small change here or there right it's not necessarily to to reference this one it's not the size of the overlay it's the fundamental purpose of the overlay and so they're completely different proposals and so i, I guess given this conversation and and where it still sounds like maybe some goals of the overlay are still up for discussion despite the planning board having voted maybe it's not time to go to the council yet maybe it's time to have those joint conversations between CRC and the planning board before it goes back to the council. Thanks. Sounds like it's a good topic for another meeting. Uh, Christine. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that um, you did have the solar bylaw on your agenda, but Stephanie Ciccarillo is not able to join us this evening and she and I have not done uh, any work since the last meeting on the solar bylaw. Um, and so you may just wanna continue this conversation and the conversation about downtown design standards and not think that you're going to have a robust discussion on the solar bylaw. I mean, it's completely up to you, but I'm just suggesting that. Yeah, and I think I, I think I just said that I think it would be smart to continue with you two because you're here and I didn't know Stephanie wasn't available. So that's, I think, really good. Um, I would like to reserve some time for some public feedback um, at some point, and I think um, again, maybe we'll do a short public, let's see how many people in the audience, two attendees in the audience. Um, let's take a, let's take a, a short, um, ask if anyone has university drive questions and comments, and then we'll move into the design standards. So I see in the audience, uh, Pat, you're muted, you're muted. Pat, you're muted. I'm sorry. I would like to set the time, um, the time period in which a person can share their public comment. So it's up to. I think that's important and that it needs to be consistent. Thank you. Would you like to put your timer on? Do you have Do you have one? Yeah. Okay. Um, what so, time do? What amount of time are you giving people? limiting to three minutes and we only have two people in the audience. So you have a max of six minutes here. Uh, I see Janet McGowan's hand up. If you could, someone could bring her into the thing to talk about University Drive. Am I here now? We're here now. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the quality and the depth of the discussion. And I, I agree. Um, with what Mandy Joe is saying is that once this goes to public hearing and you know gets referred back to the planning board, they have to give a response in a certain amount of time. And it's not really a time to redraft and mull and make decisions. And we, you know, we were sort of told this is sort of, you know, concepts and ideas. And I had the impression that the CRC would sort of take this up and dig in deeply. And I have the hopes that you would dig deeply and, you know, contact people who live there and get their thoughts. Um and I actually think it's a really exciting place. Like ever since I moved here, I thought, why isn't there, this is a housing district, you know, why isn't there more happening on University Drive? And I think it takes, I, I would hope the CRC would take the time to get it right and look at other examples. The other like little pieces. And so is, I think there was like a study of Amherst and like over $200 million is being spent outside of our community, over 20 million on food. And so I think, you know, all those people from UMass, it's the largest employer driving down University Drive, we want them to pull over and go to a restaurant, a coffee shop, get a tattoo, you know, a pet store, a clothing boutique. You know, I'm, I just I just wrote down 30 shops that I've seen in Hadley open up or small shops that we used to have. And so I think that's the reason to have the requirement of small, you know, retail, commercial, you know, professional offices, you know, so I think. I mean, hope you do the deeper dive and we have a really strong bylaw that goes out to the town council and comes back to the planning board, which I believe I won't be on, <laughs> but I can't say with any assurance. And so um, I just think that, you know, it, it, the process needs to get deeper here 
And I would, you know, go back to the planning board because nothing was, was, you know, no one was super set on anything. And there were reasons for things that were done. Having a, an open conversation would be helpful. I hope that's, I hope that's the last, the end for me. Thanks. Thank you, Martha. And then I'm going to go to Dave Zomek who has his hand up. Martha, Martha, go ahead. Martha Hanner, South Amherst. I just wanted to quickly follow up and pose a question regarding one of the comments that was brought up, bemoaning the small businesses that now do exist and would they be able to continue? Is there any precedent for having small businesses that exist being grandfathered in somehow so that they would be able to persist in some new building without having a huge rent increase. I'm thinking of Jerry Jolly and how sad it was that he was driven out of town despite being such a, you know, active participant in Amherst because his restaurant was forced out. And so I just posed the question whether it, uh, there's any precedent for being able to uh, have some grandfathered uh, clause for existing businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Zomek. Sure, thank you. Um, I guess this is a part of, part question and part comment, and I, I think it's to be posed to Christine and to Nate. Um, coming into this conversation, and and I and I thought what I heard earlier from you, particularly Christine, was that um, that it was my impression that the planning board was ready for this to be moved on through the town manager to the council. So I'm a little confused as to some comments that have been made here tonight about whether it's not ready or whether there's more discussion to be had at the planning board level. My understanding was the I thought the planning board voted on it and they they basically wanted staff to move it on to the town manager who would then move it on to the town council for a vote up or down on referral to the CRC and presumably the um, the planning board at the same time. So I'm a, could somebody clarify that a little bit? I I'm I came into this evening thinking that's where we were, and maybe I had the wrong impression. Chris or Nate. So I think that the planning board did um, want this to go to town council for referral back to them and the CRC. It is true, though, that when things are referred back to uh, to public hearing, that there are changes that are made. The changes are made because we hear from the public and the changes are um, related to discussions that occur during those public hearings. So it's not uh, it's not true that something gets referred to town council, comes back for public hearing, and then it the same exact document always goes back to town council again. Uh, things change. So and things can change in CRC public hearings and things can change in planning board public hearings. Now the, the, a lot of questions have been brought up tonight that weren't that weren't brought up during the planning board's discussion about this, but I do believe that the planning board intended that this document would go to town council. So I think what we're experiencing here is perhaps um, an evolution in that thought that maybe planning board members who were to listen to this conversation would say, oh, maybe we need to think about this further. I don't know. Nate is really the person who's most close to this, but I, I just wanted to confirm the fact that the planning board did believe that this was ready to go for a referral. Nate? Yeah, no, I mean, they've been discussing this for a year. And so I think that they're solid in their what they want this to do. And that's why, you know, like I said, we proposed a housing kind of focused overlay at one point and a mixed use one. And they chose the mixed use one. And so they're they're sure of what they want. It's, you know, possibly little details that could be changed. They're not saying, well, let's just rewrite this and allow housing only. They want it to be a mixed use overlay district. You know, maybe the changes are what percent do we change inclusionary zoning? Do we change the percent of mixed use requirements or do we specify exactly what mixed uses we want but not 
let's open it back up again and say, we're gonna allow only apartments and social dormitories. No, they want mixed use buildings. When I said that there may, there may be difference of opinion, I think in the community, others might say, well, no, let's just do this or let's do this. But in terms of the planning board, they're, they're ready. I mean, I think some members of the planning board were ready six months ago. And so there's been discussions about, you know, how could we save existing businesses? And there's been discussions about, can we require, you know, the developer to meet with staff beforehand, which we do anyways, but like, and say, can you save this? You know, are there tax breaks or some types of assessment tools that could be used outside of zoning? And so I feel like through all these discussions, you know, some of this has all been discussed in bits and pieces, but for the planning board's purpose, they're sure of this thinking that, well, yeah, like Chris mentioned, during the hearing process, there may be other considerations, but not that we're gonna say, oh, we're gonna drop mixed use buildings and now just go to apartments. I think they're sure that they want mixed use buildings. How do we maybe make changes in terms of dimensional standards or you know, percentage of use or what the uses are allowed in a mixed use building, but not changing the overlay in its entirety in terms of goal or purpose? If I could, Bam, I mean, that's that's kind of the impression I came into this meeting with and fully recognizing that change may happen after the referrals, after if the town council decides to refer this uh, out to, to committees. But I think I didn't want to leave it and go to the next topic with kind of what I heard was was this impression that, well, maybe the planning board isn't ready and maybe the planning board wants to come back and talk to CRC. I came into this meeting after being briefed by staff thinking planning board's ready. They want to move this along and, and they're willing to have the, the council consider it, consider referral. And if they don't, if the council doesn't think it's ready for a referral, then they won't refer it. And then the planning board can go back to their, to the drawing board. But if they do refer it, then there's time for more discussion and 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 change if needed, massaging of of wording and content, et cetera. So anyway, I'll stop there, but that was the point of my question. Thank you. So it in any case will end up becoming a topic for CRC to be discussing in the not too far future, probably. Let's uh, let's transition to the design guidelines. Very exciting topic. Yeah, uh, I, I'll speak to that for a bit. The town uh, has been working with Dotson and Flinker. Uh, they were selected through a request for a proposal process. So we went out, you know, did public bidding and they responded. There was a, re a review team and they, they've been selected. It was a competitive process. Uh, we're really excited to have them. They, you know, they've, They've been in town, they've ha held meetings. Um, and you know, this is a, it was, it was billed as an 18 month to two year process. It, I think that, you know, they, they plan on this being a full two year process. Uh, and so we're, um, you know, they've been doing some things. There's still a year and a half at least left in the process. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, Dotson, one reason we like them is, you know, they they they're familiar with Amherst and New England, and they can contextualize, you know, their design standards and ideas, right? So they're familiar with, they do projects all over New England, Massachusetts, and outside, but they're really familiar with kind of the New England landscape and and built environment and everything. And they also like to um, try to get consensus by using a working group. So, you know, right now it's almost a forty-person working group. They like to have meetings with them to help influence and guide their decisions, but then they also then open up to general public meetings and forums, but they're, you know, really try to have a consensus building process. And so for them, they like to do a lot of research and data and public outreach in an iterative process of more public outreach and really trying to get to a point where, you know, everyone can agree to something. And so, you know, when we were interviewing them, they said, you know, in Northampton, it was a unanimous vote to agree to form-based code. Everyone, it took a while to get there, but everyone agreed and there was no dissenting vote. So it was a, you know, all in favor. Uh, and so they really worked to try to get that. And so we like that idea in terms of a process for Amherst. Uh, it is only focused on the downtown. Um, there's been some ideas that, uh, you know, within the downtown, we could have a core set of standards and then maybe for secondary streets or transitional streets and then residential streets. And, you know, I've always thought that if these standards are, we like them, we can take them as staff in the town and then apply them elsewhere, right? We could say, well, we like what they wrote here. We're going to adapt them to East Amherst or North Amherst, but 
the focus is um, on the downtown. And so the idea is to have them, uh, I was, I'm gonna share a map, kind of look at what, you know, what is the downtown uh, in terms of kind of built environment and, and atmosphere, not just the zoning districts. And so uh, this heavy black line is kind of a preliminary idea of what they could look at. So, you know, it encompasses all of BG, BL, some neighboring residential, uh, you know, it doesn't go too far afield. It's not as big as the business improvement district, but, you know, the idea was let's not just limit it to the BG zoning district. You know, are there reasons why it could be some adjacent properties outside the BG? Uh, and, and not that they're going to say, well, yeah, this, this whole area is going to be five stories. I think the hope is that they would say what's appropriate along some of the main streets is not the same as what's, you know, down on Halleck street, but that they would address that. So if there's redevelopment, you know, what is appropriate on in these kind of transition areas. Uh, in terms of scheduling, this is something they presented recently. Uh, you know, they're, they've broken it down. So they have, you know, through December of 25. And so what they're really preparing right now, June through August is, you know, we were talking about, we've always said we'd have a website. So we're trying to get that going. They wanna do public workshops, uh, kind of, you know, get at the farmer's market, get at, um, not just you know having a meeting in town hall, but getting out into different community events, you know, a visual preference survey, and then uh, you know still working through what what people see as um, you know ideas for for downtown. Um, and they've already come up with a draft right of way standards. Some of this project was grant funded, and so we needed to have something by June thirtieth of this year in terms of what's happening in the right of way. Um, you know, materials, width of sidewalks, street tree planting areas. And so they have a draft there. Um, I think some of it has really helped to, sat to satisfy the grant. I think, you know, that is still very much a draft and under consideration, but they were, you know, worked with us in terms of getting that done for the grant program. And uh, so, you know, what we're hoping is that the process will lead to standards for the right of way, which, you know, which is what the town controls and also what's on private property. And so, you know, if, if we decide that we think a 12 foot sidewalk or whatever is necessary from curb to building, then that can inform what the setback would be. Right now in the BG, it, it's, you know, we can allow, you know, we can have no setback and all of a sudden we might have pinch points or we have a narrow sidewalk. And, and so the idea is really what, what, is, what, what do we want in terms of a streetscape and so sometimes it's also, you know, that means what happens on private property. And so, um, you know, they're, they're going to have recommendations in terms of a setback that then might, you know, have zoning implications. Uh, they're looking at the facade treatments, you know, architectural standards for the buildings along, you know, those different zones. And so, you know, the visual preference survey, you know, help guide that different presentations. They're doing uh, case studies. Um, and you know they're going to have a a number of tasks that'll lead up to these standards, and so you know consensus. I'm not sure. You know they're really still big on trying to get consensus. I think uh, you know they've asked. Well, you know, would we allow a modern building? What does that look like? You know, is it you know window patterns? Is the materials? You know, all these things are going to discuss. And so you know, I think some people, you know, planning staff have heard from some saying, well, this you know. Is this actually going to become more restrictive? What's happening? And I like to think that actually it would become a nice formula that you know if someone is proposing something in the downtown and they meet the standards, then it's an actually it's a, it's easier for the permitting board to review it. Right now, I feel like the planning board, when it's a a, a buy right use or a site plan review use, I don't feel like they feel empowered to say, well, no, push your building back five feet. And we don't like that overhang. And you know, let's change this because the, the project is essentially allowed. And so to me, these standards are gonna help everyone, the developer, uh, property owners, the permitting review and the public to know what's happening. If, you know, through these standards, if we say we wanna have, um, you know, wider sidewalks and outdoor dining and certain street trees and this type of amenity space and this type of architectural features in terms of banding between the first and second floor, uh, you know, or certain types of materials, then that's what it is. And so, you know, every time there's a project, we're not, you know, scrambling to review a project by project and say, wow, is this contextual? Does it fit? We already know it will. And so 
the idea is let's start having better conversations in terms of, you know, what do we want to see downtown? Um, so anyways, the, what in the packet, it's hard to read, but they have in the request for proposals, we had a detailed task list and they broke it out by task and subtask. Uh, and so, you know, right now we're, um, you know, we're still really in task two and then we have task, uh, task three, four and five and six. And they say, you know, and they've kind of folded in in the middle here, bringing some of these later tasks up earlier to try to, you know, get people's opinions sooner say they might put out design guidelines just to see what people think, even though it's way down on task five, but they would just want to start that process and discussion in terms of, okay, how can we build consensus? What are really, you know, are there points of consensus? Are there points of disagreement? You know, what, what are really the, the, you know, things we need to focus on. And so, you know, I'd say that beginning in late August, starting in September, they're really going to be doing a lot of um, public meetings and outreach. Um, you know, the visual preference survey will have an online, you know, website with an online comment form and all the information will be posted up there. And so I think much of the process is still yet to come. Christine. Hi, I just wanted to mention that um, the process really started off with the consultant asking us staff to make recommendations about um, stakeholder groups. And we had um, different stakeholder groups that we thought of, um, business people, residents, um, shop owners, developers. I can't remember all the different stakeholder groups. So we um, suggested names to the um, to the uh, consultants that people who would fit into those groups and they took those groups and met with them separately. We weren't part of the meetings and they presented information to them and asked them questions to get their ideas and their input about, you know, what did these different stakeholder groups feel about the downtown area and how it could be made better. And then um, after the stakeholder group meetings, they um, came back to us and said, well, we would like to know about um, how to develop a working group. So um, we made recommendations about some of the members who had been part of the stakeholder groups who represented different um, you know, entities in town, just like I said, business owners, developers, residents, um, shopkeepers, et cetera. And we have now formed a working group that is, I don't know, 30 or 40 people. Nate probably knows better. Um, and we've tried to make it representative. It, it isn't completely representative of all um, the different groups in town, but we're trying to add people to make it more representative. Um, and, the develop and the consultant has been working with that group. And again, Nate and I haven't been part of those meetings, but they've had two or three meetings in town hall with, this, with the working group presenting information to them and soliciting input. And I think they've had very good meetings um, from what I've heard from the consultants. And sometimes I'm here at night and I hear what goes on in town hall because my, our town room, because my office is right next to it. So I can kind of hear a lively discussion going on. So that's kind of where we are now. The next thing is that they're going to have um, a multi-day uh, public forum and they're hoping to do that in September. Um, they've chosen the weekend of September 13th through the 15th. The 13th is a Friday, 14th is a Saturday, and 15th is a Sunday. So what they're hoping to do is have um, one location, like um, perhaps the Crocker Farm uh, cafeteria or the large activity room at the bank center or the cafeteria at the high school. We haven't exactly settled on a venue yet. Um, and that at that meeting, um, it would be a multi-day event where the consultants would invite, you know, anybody who wanted to show up and they would give them a presentation and then take them through a series of exercises um, to seek public in input about certain things. So we're hoping that that will come along and that's going to be pretty soon. That's only mm -hmm. mid-September. So here it is the end of July. So it's another, you know, maybe six or seven weeks from now that they'll be doing that. And I think a lot more information about what they've gathered from the stakeholder groups and what they've gathered from the working group will come out at that time and we'll be privy to it then too. We haven't really seen much of what their work product has been, but um, that's that's kind of the process to date. So I just wanted to inform you about that. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Haneke. 
Thank you. Um, some questions for clarification and then and then some others. Um, can we get a draft of the right of way standards that are draft standards so that we can see them? Um, the, you, you talked a lot about standards um, and then you mentioned form-based zoning at some point. Um, I had heard a rumor that Dodson and Flinker were thinking that these would not be mandatory, that they'd just be guidelines that might need to be followed, might could be followed, but that they wouldn't. Is this envisioned as a essentially a form-based zoning rezoning of this particular area? Um, or is it envisioned as more of the design guidelines that are a little more specific, but that are currently in the bylaw as just guidelines? Because um, I know I envisioned it as form-based zoning. Um, and then standards, you talked about maybe being able to move them on, but I looked at, the, you know, I, and I've got questions about, you know, the, I'm glad to see that the area is being expanded beyond just the BL and BG. Um, but I'm concerned if we're trying to fit one sort of form to all of those areas when some of them are small residential buildings that have a different form than a large commercial block, like our downtown center Pleasant Street block. Um, so can you talk about how they might deal with that? Um, thank you for describing some of the stakeholder groups. Um, were the stakeholders actually including downtown businesses and downtown landowners? And what about residents that aren't near the downtown, like just residents of Amherst or students of Amherst, not those directly adjacent to downtown. And then I'd like a list of who's on the working group. I actually have some concerns about a working group that did not go out for public application. And it sounds like this did not, um, that it was just based on um, who you thought of, which is not necessarily bad, but it's limited to your, your own network then instead of other people who might be interested that might not be in your network. So can we get a list of um, people who are on it, uh, what was the process for getting on it? If other people want to get on it, whether it be counselors or other members of the public, how do they get themselves known to be interested in being on such a working group? Um, and are the working group meetings public? I haven't seen anything come across the public notices that these meetings are public. And so um, are minutes being taken? Can I go attend one? How would I know when one is taking place if I want to? Or is this really just a private meeting amongst whoever was put on the working group? Um, and I'm here asking that when they do those boards and committee meetings that they come not just to CRC, but they come to the council for some of them too. Thank you. Can we respond now? Or to yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in the request for proposal, which you know the CRC looked at in the planning board, it took a while to develop. We, you know, identified a number of stakeholders, a lot of public meetings, and you know, one reason uh, we like Dotson and they said that they're always available to you know meet more than you know say we prescribed. And so um, I think that you know I think we had at one point we had counted up. I mean it was like two dozen meetings plus events plus public workshops. I mean we really put a build in a lot of time with, uh, with staff, boards and committees and the public. Um, and also in the RFP, we did specify that we'd like to see three, you know, at least three kind of design standards to meet the context of those neighborhoods, right? So it's not like they're gonna say in that, within that boundary, it's all one standard, that they would actually respond to what's there now and what they see as appropriate, you know, massing and height and everything. And so, you know, my idea and what we wrote into the RFP and, you know, was that right? So there might be a core, you know, there may be a core area that has a set of density or regulations, and then it is different, say, on Kellogg Ave than it is on North Pleasant Street. And so, you know, it wasn't that they're going to write one standard to apply everywhere. Uh, in terms of what is it, it was never form-based code. It's a, so in, in Northampton, when they wrote form-based code, they essentially, um, you know, looked at the use table and a, a lot the dimensional standards and they rewrote a lot you know a lot of the zoning bylaw they you know took what was there replaced it with say 70 pages of form based code and so that's not what we're asking them to do in terms of writing zoning they will have you know it can be a lengthy design standard report it can be graphics and so 
in the request for proposal, you know, we said that it, uh, there's a possibility of it being incorporated into the zoning bylaw or the general bylaw if it applies to the public right of way. And so, uh, you know, they've asked that question, you know, how much is this going to become requirements or, you know, is this just a, an advisory uh, piece? And I'd like to think that it becomes a requirement, uh, you know, in part because we're going through this effort. To me, it's a it's a requirement that they be followed, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be zoning. It can be referenced and cited in the zoning that these standards apply and are used by the permit granting authorities in their review of projects. And so, you know, we're not going to have a hundred page design standard in the zoning bylaw, but it'll be, um, you know, cited and referenced. And so then it becomes um, used. And so for the working groups, you know, the working group is a, is not, uh, it's not for the benefit of the town manager of the town. It's a working group for the benefit of our consultant. And so they've used this model in various towns. You know, they are taking minutes. It's all dots and uh, their employees. And so, you know, we didn't, this isn't like a working group that is subject to open meeting law. It's something that's helping the consultant uh, with their process. And so, you know, everything that they learn there, the idea is they're going to take it out and then present it at all their other public meetings and workshops and things. And it gets incorporated into their, standards in their documents. And so, you know, it's not as if we're saying, you know, make a recommendation to the town manager and that type of, as, as that working group, it's really, they're just here to help the consultants. And so staff, you know, we don't attend the working group meetings. Uh, and the idea is that it's really for the benefit of Dodson. And so, uh, yeah, right now, I think it's probably about 39 people. And so it has grown. And so we had a list of people, we emailed and called, um, you know, different property owners, business owners, stakeholders, and the idea was, you know, first, are they interested? And then could they commit to, you know, six to nine group meetings over a series of, you know, two years? And then uh, they've had held two meetings. And since then, even just, you know, I think yesterday, another name came in, you know, saying, oh, well, this person, you know, doesn't live in the downtown, but, you know, might be, you know, is good. You know, uh, a lot of people said, could someone from the public shade tree committee be associated with this? Because there's been a lot of talk about, you know, shade trees and green infrastructure. And could we have someone knowledgeable and interested in town with this? Could we have someone from, you know, historic, someone interested in, you know, bike, you know, bike and pedestrian networks. And so Dodson had said in their communities they work with, they try to have, you know, a range of stakeholders and perspectives. You know, essentially they'd say it'd be great if every person represented something different. And then, you know, uh, it can be, you know, multiple viewpoints in this working group. And so, you know, we've been, um, amenable to adding people, I think at some point, you know, you know, if it, to me, it's like, once you get to 40 people, do you really, you know, maybe you get to 45, but after that, you're just not going to have any more. And some of it is that all this information will be public and there's probably many opportunities for people to provide comments on it. So, like I said, this working group is a chance for Dodson to bounce ideas off and, you know, refine some things and then make it all public again. But their, their ideas, you know, if we have enough, stakeholders in this are we getting somewhere that there's some consensus about um about some of their ideas and so you know i don't you know I, I think that if people are interested sure um they've been really gracious to say let's add people but i, I they haven't said there's a limit i just think at some point there probably is just in terms of how you can accommodate you know 40 people in a room uh they said they, they do set up as a zoom meeting to accommodate people remotely it's not a hybrid meeting we don't manage it but you know, they've, they've been able to accommodate, you know, the 39 people so far. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, so I did want to ask if, so this multi-day forum, the weekend of September 13th to 15th, that's something you would let the council know enough ahead of time so we can let our, you know, get the information out to our district mailing lists. And the other thing, I don't know, would, could they, could could we have this as a topic at our district meetings at some point? Even a representative from Dotson and Flickr or Blinker? Um, because I'm just I'm just thinking of just I wouldn't know about this <laughs> if I wasn't on the council. So I'm just wondering how many people out there, you know, in terms of our uh district residents know this is happening. So, but I'm sure they would be interested if if they knew. So I don't know how much of an imposition that is on the consultant's time, but if there was a possibility um, of them coming to just, you know, at some point over the next year, coming to a district meeting or just each district's meeting. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, we could ask. I mean, I you know we didn't have that as part of the process. Uh, staff could do it, or you know they might be willing. Um, you know, we I've been in discussions with trying to get the web page going, uh, and so then really at least making everything available publicly. So you know, it's uh, it's some of it's here and there, but really consolidating it, and then um, and so you know then we can at least uh, point you know have that be a uh, you know one one place for someone to look. Uh, for oh, I mean, maybe it's something where if we had a district meeting, we could ask the yeah, yeah, yeah. staff to come. Okay, thanks. You know, I, I think for dots and they would, you know, they might, I just don't want to say yes to them and then have them go right. to every, you know, area. And then it's all of a sudden like they're, you know, it's a full blown workshop for them. And so, you know, is it, like, at what point in the process would it be good for them to go? But yeah. Um, I actually had my hand up, but it disappeared, but I'll go back to the MB. Councilor Hanneke. Oh, um. So the website, I think, would be extremely valuable now. I think if they're already doing working group meetings and taking minutes and all, there's just no information available for someone who's not sort of connected to the planning department or Dodson and Flinker, frankly, you know, um, because there's no information available anywhere. There's no public knowledge that any of this is happening. Um, and in some sense that concerns me um, that that the process is six months in and we don't have access to those documents um, even though there have already been two working group meetings. I'd like to know the constituencies that are on the working group. Um, I am still concerned about the makeup of the working group that it sounds like potentially that anyone who asks might be able to be on it, but to be able to ask, you have to know. Um, and that's something that I guess if I go back to my charter commission days was near and dear to the charter commission of prohibiting or breaking down and breaking up the needing to already be in the know to be able to get involved. Um, and, and that's my concern here with a working group that comes solely from re recommendations from the planning department or someone who's already on the working group, it sounds like, um, and not a general call for working group members. Um, because a general call for working group members might get a more diverse group of people that is being then consulted that is being that these ideas are being run off of and I know there's this public process coming up um, but it sounds like the working group might be the heart of it and or part of the heart of it and a working group that's part of the heart of it that is formed only from needing to know someone and needing to already be involved concerns me. I had a couple questions and um, it would be it would be great to see what was presented as part of the grant uh, application, even if it's rough uh, streetscape standards, whatever that uh, it would be really fun to be able to see that. Um, I had a similar question of are we are we creating um, standards or are we creating guidelines? And I know that, for instance, the, um, the the design review board has guidelines. And I can tell you if, you know, my interpretation of of what they're, um, my interpretation is different than members of the design review board from time to time. So I, I understand that it's, you can't dictate what a town is gonna look like specifically over time. Um, but I'm again curious standards versus versus guidelines. Um, I like the fact that there are a couple of scales of of re uh, development that are being considered. Um, if I think about the downtown area, there are actually very few chunks of real estate that are up for conversion or up for conversation even. Um, Unless we're looking 150 years out, there may be some changes in some of the some of the structures uh, in the downtown area. 
Um, but I'm I'm excited to hear what the working group also has has been discussing. And I understand that they're trying to develop some some parameters for decision making. And I think that's uh, I'm I'm happy to leave them to that process. Um, what else did I jot down? Um, actually, I think that's it. But thank you. Anyone else comments or or questions? Dave, you you're kind of doing your hand. Oh, okay. Um, Councilor Haneke. I I just had one I forgot to say, and and I wanted to clarify something Nate said because I I don't think it was accurate. Nate implied early on in his presentation that CRC had reviewed the RFP. Um, as far as I know, CRC never saw the RFP before it went out. Um, so I. Don't even, I, I, maybe it's in tonight's SharePoint folder and packet, but I'm not sure CRC ever saw it before it went out. Um, so I just wanted to make that clarification or ask for that clarification because I don't think it was ever on a meeting of CRC. Chris? I think the planning board saw it. I yeah. think the planning board saw the RFP for this project. And I remember, you know, comments coming in from Doug Marshall. Can't remember others, but um, maybe that's what the confusion is that we thought it was CRC, but I believe it was actually the planning board. It, it was, I would agree with Mandy, it was not the, the CRC. I remember seeing a, a very early copy of it. I didn't see any of the later copies, but that was because I asked for it. Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe it wasn't CRC. I know, Pam, you had provided comments and the planning board looked at it twice. And so, you know, they, you know, through that process, you know, there were changes to some of the tasks and description of the town and other things. So, you know, we had the, this would have been, I mean, this is, um, gosh, this could have been like almost a year ago that we started looking at this. And then it was um, discussed in the fall of 23. And so Dotson was chosen in, maybe December of 23 and they started work in late January. So early February. Um, yeah. So maybe I misspoke, but I know Pam and I thought others had, I know there was public comment that was received about it and was discussed publicly. Thank you. I'm looking at Councillor Ette or Pat DeAngelis. Any, any other questions for design guidelines? Nada. Okay. I'm delighted that you were available to come tonight. And although we didn't discuss solar at all, um, this has been really productive and very helpful. I'm, I'm glad uh, Councillor Haneke had asked several times if this could occur. So I'm, I hope she's happy and uh, had a chance to ask her questions. I think, um, I think that kind of wraps it up. Oh, Pat, you have your hand up now. It wraps this part up. I'm not commenting yeah. on anything that we've just been talking about, the design standards. I want to move on. Good. And okay. So I have something to say about moving on if you're ready. Okay. But I thank um, Chris and Nate for the work you've been doing. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think we could release uh, Nate and Chris from duty and appreciate your time. And uh, if obviously if people have questions, they should be forwarded to uh, Nate and Chris uh, as part of that co conversation. Can I ask if people can hear me? We can hear you when you unmute. I am unmuted, uh, but you guys froze. So I'm trying oh. to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Yes, you're clear now. Uh, the next on our agenda item was solar bylaw. And I will I will say very specifically that at our next meeting, which is in August, and it is August 13, um, I would very much like to talk about process, next steps, focus, and um, I think we could do some of that now, Pam. That would be great. That'd be super. 
And I mean, one of the things that I think, and, and Mandy, you got me thinking about this, um, about moving to battery storage. We have taken a first pass. There are things still to be worked on in the solar bylaw as it's been uh, presented so far. Um, you know, I'm even getting ready to remove the nexus statements and things like that because, you know, there's a lot of, but I feel like right now, as Mandy brought up, the state is coming in on large scale ground mounted. But we heard earlier from Martha Hanner about the fact that municipalities will be able to do smaller uh, things as long as the process takes just a year. So it seems to me we need to continue with the solar bylaw. But my feeling is that the next step are to send what we have so far to all of the other committees that we want input from and let them start to work on that while we look at battery storage. So that's what I was hoping that we would be able to do. Um, so that's I'll stop there. Okay, and I definitely want to come back to that. Yeah. Um, Councilor Haneke. So I appreciate Martha and public comment bringing up the state of the um, bills that are out of the House and Senate. They're largely similar. They're slightly different. They're in um, conference committee right now mm -hmm. um, because I am concerned that we might spend a lot of time. I, I actually disagree with Ms. Hanner um, on her conclusion about this, which is why I wanted to bring it up. You know, the that bills, if signed and if conferenced out, um, would have would have the state providing regulations and guidance, developing the regulations and guidance in a new division of clean energy siting and permitting housed within the Department of Energy Resources, even for projects that are the consolidated permit under the 25 megawatts um, for generation and infrastructure storage under 100 megawatts. Um, and so I feel like I'm not sure it's efficient for us to spend a lot of time coming up with our own sort of regulations and guidance on where to cite and what site backs and this and that are when they might be in five, six, seven months overridden by the state. Um, I think there's a lot we as a committee need to be doing. Um, not just with solar, but with housing, with other environmental things. Um, these are projects under 25 megawatts. You know, I've, I've talked about what are we doing to encourage solar projects in places we want it, particularly um, on rooftops and on parking lots and other built infrastructure and wouldn't would our time be better spent looking at how to encourage and what we should be doing bylaw wise to encourage or regulation wise? Is there something we can do that would allow us to, could we change our zoning to say, well, all, all new buildings must have solar on their roofs. Is that something we can actually do that is pro building of solar where we want it while we wait for the state regulations and guidelines to settle out um, because I don't want us to spend eight months writing guidelines that then eight months from now are completely overridden by state law um, because we could have been doing something more in those eight months. Um, so I, I think we need to take a step back and see where is our time best spent given the uncertainty of the state law. And then if this passes and gets signed, which we might know by our next meeting, given mm -hmm. the knowledge that that state law might actually say the Division of Clean Energy Siting and Permitting is coming up with regulations and guidelines for local permitting and that we're gonna have to follow them whatever they are. Um, and so maybe not writing a bylaw, but coming up with ways to advocate to that might be better use of our time instead of spending it on bylaw writing or doing something else. So I'd like to take a step back. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, that was, in, in essence, the conversation that I was hoping to have. And I think we do not have enough time to do that tonight. Um, 
I I um, would actually lean in the direction of having having Amherst have its house in order and its um, its documents in really good shape because I think uh, I think it will be valuable as a tool to help direct what the state these people these people are going to be reaching out they're going to be looking they're going to look at Pioneer Valley Planning Committee Commission. They're going to look at other standards and templates. They're going to look at Cape Cod, and they can look at Amherst. And Amherst will be a good example, I think, of um, how to how to have a clear process. I'd like to I'd like to have us thinking about what is a clear and concise process if we are required to go to a 12 month um, uh, standard. Uh, I've heard I've heard the director of um, planning department say. 12 months is a really tough sell. There, there are a lot of hurdles to go through. What can we do in the preparation of our of our own um, zoning to uh, pave the way for that and, and get our ducks in, in order? Um, Pat, you talked about sending this to the, the actual departments and committees and boards in town. They have never actually been asked to weigh in on it. And, and one of the things I want to leave you with is that I would be very willing to take a first pass at all the comments that we've received, the comments that were made during CRC meetings, and clean out some of the stuff that was felt to be kind of extraneous and have that as a document that could go to the different boards and, and, and committees to get their general feedback, not as an not as a line by line edit, but what are your thoughts on this topic? What are your thoughts on this topic? What should we consider and what has to be part of this bylaw? So that's that's the approach that I would like very much to follow. Pat, I mean, Councilor Haneke. So if that is an approach we follow, I would like the committee to be able to submit questions that we would like answered. I'm not sure, you know, the bylaw itself in my mind is a mess that it's not something to go off of um, in terms of asking for feedback on the specific language in it. I would rather us figure out using the bylaw as sort of a guide, say, what questions do we have? You know, Pam, you, you got to some of it. Um, things like, what would your setbacks be? from wells from that would you have different setbacks from x y or z not present them with a bylaw that was already drafted with setbacks but i'd want their unvarnished opinion on do we need setbacks or do we need to protect x or y and if so how would you do it um, i'd like a chance for the committee to come up with the questions to ask the different boards and committees rather than send a document off that I have a lot of questions about that when we went through the last couple of meetings, I was told it wasn't time to ask those questions. We were just trying to figure out, did that section make sense? Um, because I got a lot of changes I want from the thing. I, I have a lot of discussion I'd like to have, but I'm willing to start with a very general set of questions to go to boards and committees but I'd like a chance for CR, if that's the way we go, for CRC to be able to draft those questions. Then I would ask for any member of this committee to send me the questions and they will be in the next packet. I will have a list of, like an ongoing list of questions that we would want boards and committees um, to be asked so that they can provide that kind of feedback. So that that would be questions specifically, say, for um, the Conservation Commission or okay, or ECAC or whatever. Yeah, okay. there is a there is a memo in in our packet, and it was included it was included in the packet and in our folder, and it was it was the original request that I made to the planning department on um, staff and or committee input on the different sections. And I would suggest read that as a start. I had a I had a series of questions that I asked and then what input that I thought was appropriate for each of the sections in the in the bylaw. Take a look at that. Maybe that's a starting point. Where for, is that, Pam? It's in our file, in our folder. And it's called 
memo for input or something like that, in, info request, input request to planning director. Okay. Um, Jennifer, and then I have a very quick GOL question. So I don't know if this is out of order, but I did see there was a hand up in the uh, audience. Okay, I'd like to I'd like to get our business done here first. Um, thank you, thank you. Though I wasn't looking, um, I have a question for Pat and or Councilor Ette. Any idea when the nuisance bylaw is going to be discussed in GOL, um, so that we can talk about it again here if we have to. I suppose the plan would be for our next meeting. And that is what date? Give me a moment to check that. Thank you. Well, he's looking. I have, uh, we have minutes of February 27, and I'm looking for a motion if anyone would like to uh, move to accept those minutes as provided. Council Ete. August 8th. August 8th, okay. I may not be readily available to answer questions. In fact, I, I'm not gonna be readily available. I move that we accept the minutes and I don't know what the date of them is. Uh, February 27 and March 12th. If you want to do one at a time, that's fine. No, let's do them together. Okay. So uh, second? Second. Second, thank you. I, I didn't unmute, sorry. Thank you. Um, we'll take a vote on acceptance of those minutes. Pat. Aye. I'm just going in order on my screen. Pam Rooney is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Dave Zomack. Oops. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Jennifer Taub. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, those will be those will be put uh, as as accepted. Um, let's see. Uh, I have no specific announcements. The next agenda preview definitely solar bylaw conversation. Hopefully nuisance bylaw conversation, and. I don't think we are going to be discussing the planning board appointments, um, but we may have to. So I'm going to leave it on the. Uh, I'm going to leave it on the next. Preview. We also have battery storage to think about. Okay, I was wrapping that under solar, but I can add battery. Thank you. Anything else not anticipated within Councilor Haneke? Um. I know I missed the last meeting, so could you update me on, it was my understanding that y'all voted nuisance out of this committee. And so yes. why would it be coming back to us? It, because it went to the, the last clause was the severability, which you had highlighted. And, and we acknowledged that, we acknowledged to GOL that, um, it should be covered because it's under general bylaw and that there's already a clause in our general bylaws to cover that as you pointed out, but that um, KP law um, was going to be asked by the town manager in any case to review the document one more time and that clause in particular. So hopefully they recommend that we take it out. I guess I don't understand why in any of that things it would need to come back to the CRC because that's all stuff GOL would deal right. with. So I guess I'm just con confused. I'm 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 half anticipating that something comes back and they say we can't deal with this. CRC, you need to give us a better answer. I hope not. I think we did a really good, clear job, but who the heck knows? Okay. So I'd, I'd like to leave it on the agenda just in case. I, I hope, I hope, I'm looking at our two counselors on that committee. I hope it's smooth and wonderful and gets sent to council. Um, anything else for us tonight? Martha Hanner has a raised hand. Um, are we willing, it's 
We have one minute. Martha Hanna, Hanna, you have one minute. Can someone bring her in? Thank you. I just wanted to respond here. Um, pose the first question about in the argument about the solar bylaw. Do we really want to sit back, be passive, and do nothing and let the state dictate the terms under which we have to work for solar bylaws? Wouldn't it be better for us to just go ahead and set the, the, the standards and requirements that we want? the information we want developers to submit to us, the information we feel is important, the um, flood control or erosion control, stormwater management, protection of private water wells. Aren't those things important to anybody? Aren't they things that we would like to specify? So that's the first question. The second question about you know, wasting time, we wasted. We spent 18 months working this on this. Seven people trying to get as educated as possible about the state requirements, the background, the battery storage, the stormwater, the um, et cetera, et cetera. And now this group has dithered around for eight months since then. And now we hear that it would take another eight months to quote, fix the language here seems to me that it's time to send this to the various committees. After all, what committee is going to use it? The ZBA. Don't you want to hear what they think is important to include? Don't you want to hear what the Conservation Commission thinks is important to include? I would say that we need to just, after dithering for well over two years, we need to focus, get the com various committees to respond to us, and then decide if you can put together a bylaw in something less than eight months. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. And we're going to call for adjournment of the meeting. Um, I make that motion. Any second? Any second now, I mean. Second. <laughs> okay. We'll go around the room. Pat. Aye. Pam, I. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. And Janet Taub. Uh, yes. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dave, thank very you. much. Does the